Good morning, everybody. Are you having a good weekend so far? I hope it's about to get a little bit better. So listen, we're uh, just about to launch into an encouraging time in Bible study this weekend. But before we do, I want to thread you guys in on a couple things and have you watch a truly uh, just meaningful, pretty gripping little video piece. Uh, a lot of you have been asking about Easter, and I want to give you just a couple outcomes. Um, it's not the whole story, but it's a significant part of the story of what God's up to in this church family and into our lives individually. Uh, last weekend in our six Easter gatherings, uh, we had 5,700 people on campus, part of our experience here, uh, including 950 children. And so you guys are taking this fill the earth and subdue thing very seriously. And uh, so uh, in, in, in that mix of nearly 6,000 people here, scores of decisions or recommitments to Christ, and we're working hard to follow up on those, including leading me to the next thing, which is water baptism. So we're going to have the little swimming pool set up here next weekend, right? And this is your last chance, either online or you could call uh, the campus on Monday and get your name in to be baptized in water this upcoming weekend. If you're a person that's begun your relationship with God, uh, you need to be baptized, not to be saved, but because you've already made that commitment to Christ, surrendered your life to Christ. You don't have to be perfect or a fully mature believer, but you've begun the process. We need to baptize you in water. And yes, we have 110 outlets, so you can fix your hair with a blow dryer, tease it, frost it, whatever else you want to do before you come back in the house after water baptism. The water will be warm. It's going to be a great experience. If you're interested in doing that, there's a class Wednesday night that you've got to be part of. We don't want people being baptized unless they have a good centered sense of what the Bible teaches that baptism actually means, right? Because it's a, it's a once in a lifetime experience for most believers. So wanted to mention that to you. Last thing I want to say about last weekend, we received an offering, uh, both a tithe and then over and above the tithe, a love offering for uh, our Contra Costa County Family Justice Center. Uh, I want to thank you uh, as a church family for giving $7,600 to that. And, and we're not done yet because you can give online through the weekend, either text or online. Carrie and I will take the check to Susan Kim. You may remember as executive director, she was with us a couple weekends ago. We will hand her a check this upcoming week. I'd love it to be $10,000. So if you've not had a chance to give yet, uh, to the Family Justice Center. Remember, it's about people that are victims of domestic violence. It is rampant across the United States and including in Contra Costa County. And also some of those monies and investment go toward the, really the horror of what's happening with trafficking. There was a lead article in the county paper uh, this morning that you may want to check into online. Uh, the only other thing I'll mention about giving, thank you for being so faithful in the tithe because that restores and, and resources, rather, everything that God's calling us to do and be here. So above the money for the Family Justice Center, the regular tithe last week was $125,000. Thank you for your faithfulness and what God is up to in this church family. I only say these things, all, all really credit and glory obviously belong to Christ alone, but to give us a big sense because if this is the only service you ever attend, you don't know what's going on in the rest of the church. And I've got to tell you, some epic stuff is happening at such kind of warp speed, it's hard to keep up with it, which is a good problem. So Anthony Flores is one of the outstanding young men in our church. Uh, you may see Anthony up here actually leading worship in a lot of gatherings on many weekends. About six months ago, a horrible thing happened to Anthony uh, and his two sons. And that is Anthony's 32-year-old uh, wife, Galera, passed away and died, went home to heaven of pneumonia, shockingly. People should not die at age 32. Uh, so now Anthony is a single father of two sons and trying to put his life back together again. We are talking about rebounding this weekend. How to rebound from the dark, painful places in life. We'll talk more in just a moment, but first watch this. My name is Anthony Flores. I am 34 years old. I have two kids. Um, 
Avery and Evan. They are 14 and 8. A few months ago, uh, I lost my wife, Clara, and uh, she passed away because of pneumonia. Um, then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, um, she said that she couldn't really breathe that much and she wanted me to call 911. My oldest, Avery, and I rushed to the hospital emergency room. Um, from there, um, she just was having a hard time breathing. Um, she was hyperventilating and eventually the doctor just said, hey, um, we need to put a trachea in her so that at least she could, you know, not really force herself to breathe, but she's assisted in breathing. Um, so they put that uh, in her lungs and I'd say a minute later, her heart stopped. Throughout that time, they did CPR for, I'd say almost an hour. After that hour, they said that uh, it wouldn't make sense for us to continue on. The struggles that we're gonna have is just mainly the, uh, just that, that feeling of loss, that, that missing feeling, you know? Uh, Whenever we open up gifts and the time where I would just have, you know, hot cocoa and just talk to her. Uh, that's definitely gonna be tough. It's one less present under the tree. Just to see the kids grow and experience things without her, that's just gonna be tough. When it comes to him, I understand that he's the only piece that I have. And the fact that anytime I need to talk to him, he's there. What he's done to me and my kids has really shown me that he's never left me. I see God's presence with me by love. Um, the love that he shared directly by him talking to me directly and not only that but through other people when it comes to surrendering I mean that's all I can do um, I have to surrender myself because you know there's times where you just think you fully surrender and you feel a little bit of his presence and you but at the same time you're working off your own will. Um, but what I realized is that you have to fully surrender and let go. Once you surrender with your arms open, Jesus is there with his hands open too to give you a big hug and realize that he's there. He's there, he's present, and he's always there with us and he, he, God is definitely with us. Did you catch his words at the end, fully surrendered, fully surrendered? Remember that. We're going to come back to that and totally let go. We're going to need to know this before our Bible study is over this morning. So we are talking these days about rebounding, spiritual rebounding. We're in a series on the life of David, and we're calling it Pursuit. You may want to reach for the notes that you uh, received when you came in. Some of you do notes dig digitally uh, on version. Um, we also have hard copy Bibles, English and Spanish, in the back of the room. Or if you have your Bible or device with you, we are going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 30. It says 2 Samuel. I biffed. Uh, that's on me. It's 1 Samuel chapter 30. And we'll be looking that, at that in just a moment, verses 1 through 6, okay? Let me set the table. Our man David had a PhD in rebounding. You know why? He had to, because he messed up so much. This spiritual journey that you and I are on, all at different stages at some level, right? You can't, is a marathon, not a sprint, and we can't win the race 
unless we actually finish the race. I'm not saying it's going to be pretty. It will definitely not be pain-free. But we cannot possibly win something that we do not finish. And so we're going to talk today about a very critical component to developing the capacity to complete what we've begun in our spiritual journey. The Bible puts it this way, that he who began a good work in us will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. Watch this. If we'll let him. If we don't, he can't. And we'll choose not to. Now, uh, David faced a lot of difficulties in life. Let's just do a quick review. You may remember as a boy he was rejected by his family. As the anointed king, but not yet the king in reality, you may remember he was persecuted by King Saul. When he was king at the height of his powers, you may remember that he uh, endured an incredible betrayal by his most beloved son, Absalom. Now, I don't want to paint Dan, uh, David as the innocent victim because a lot of times David invited pain in his life because he made absolutely the stupidest decisions, unwise decisions. David was a fiery temperament, and sometimes he would flash and make decisions in the heat of emotions. How many of you know whenever we make decisions when we're emotionally amped up, it's almost always the wrong decision? Any of you ever discovered that? If you haven't discovered that yet, just ask the people that you live with. They'll help you understand if you've got that habit pattern going on in your life. But David, through a combination of immaturity, poor judgment, fear, neglect, anger, lust, pride, a mix of all those things going on in his life, would do some really dumb stuff. I've put a partial listing uh, on your notes there. Walk through this with me real quick. quick. We're doing a, a quick cursory look at some of the low moments through the whole scope of David's life. So he failed at one point in his life and 85 priests were assassinated because David made a very poor decision. He failed at another time and dishonored God. He is seeking political asylum in the court of the king of the Philistines, Israel's mortal enemy, by feigning insanity. He was at that point certifiably a psychological fruit loop. Okay, that's what's going on in David's life. Don't paint it as anything otherwise. He was a man crazed at that point with fear and self-doubt. Have you ever been there? Uh, he failed morally, and this is his big one. We all know about it. Uh, the infamous uh, adultery with Bathsheba moment. We know the rest of that story that he failed, and he had an innocent man uh, murdered, her husband Uriah, to cover up his immorality. You may remember that David failed by mishandling the sacred Ark of the Covenant and people died. You may remember he failed when he did not discipline his son Amnon for raping his half-sister Tamar. Yes, there was incest in the household of David. Uh, he failed and he paid a terrible price when he didn't restrain his insecure, power-hungry son Absalom from leading a political coup d'etat. He failed uh, by yielding to Satan's temptation to take a census of the fighting men of Israel, a, a, uh, an action that was initiated really by David's pride and leaning on his own capacity rather than God's sufficiency. Now, on the way to the evidence that we've just looked at, if we had the vote right now, and you and I had the vote on whether the evidence suggests that David was obviously a major man of God, or David was obviously sort of a major mess up. If it were up to me, I'd kind of vote for the mess up side of the ledger. I mean, when David failed, he didn't fail little, he failed big. Uh, and we see that recurring in his life. Sometimes to great success for God, sometimes to great infamy and pain in his life and in the life of his family and people he cared about. Now, take your Bible in hand. Let's see yet another saga in David's life, okay? At the very least, this guy led an interesting life. No boring about David. I'm in 1 Samuel 30. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, and then we're going to skip down and read verses 17, 18, and 19, okay? Verse 1, 1 Samuel 30. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now, the Amalekites had, raised, had raided the Negev and Ziklag. Now, 
the Negev and Ziklag are the desert regions of what we know today as the nation of Israel. They'd attacked Ziklag and burned it, had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters were taken captive. Verse 4, so David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Have you ever been there before? You cried so much and so hard there were no tears left. That's what's going on in this dark moment, David's life. Verse 5, David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. You say, John, whoa, time out. More than one wife? Yeah, we already talked about that whole issue with the tendencies of ancient monarchs and kings uh, having multiple wives, concubines, and all it led them to was an incredible amount of heartache and confusion. Verse 6, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of their sons and daughters. See, to make matters worse, David's whole family has been taken. The city has been burned. All their possessions plundered. And now the dudes are talking about killing him. Have you ever had a bad day? Okay? So look at the rest of verse 6. You need to not miss this last sentence of verse 6. But David found strength in the Lord his God. You may want to just make a note there in, in the margin there, or some kind of a highlight. That's why he was able to rebound from this. That's why. Because he paused when his life was on the line, his, his life was in a place of destruction, and he found strength in God. So David did what you and I would just love him to do, the kind of stuff you and I would love that we would do. He said, I've had it. And he got all the guys together, and boom, they took off on an all-night sprint to run those suckers down that took their wives and children and all their stuff, and they caught them. Check it out in verse 17. Look at it. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day. None of them got away except for 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. You ever ridden a camel? I have. They're nasty, spitting creatures. They don't really run. They sort of run, but it's not comfortable on the hump, if you know what I'm saying. 400 dudes are booking it, right? David, I'm in verse 18, recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. So it seems to be a happy ending, but just before that, David was crying so hard he had no tears left, and his best friends, his allies in arms, were talking about killing him. And David, in that moment, found strength in God. Now, I want us to learn a very important lesson in this whole issue of rebounding this morning. When problems, failures, loss, even self-inflicted pain come our way in life, make note of this, it's important. In the Bible, almost always, God uses the desert as his classroom for our lives. Let me say that again. In the Bible, the desert is always God's classroom. Now, move beyond the idea geographically of a desert, okay? Not just a, a, a sandy place, waste, arid, little rain, lizards, cactus, whatever, howling winds. The desert places of our lives, the lonely places, the dry places, the places where we are bereft, without hope. All the hope has been sucked from our lungs and from our heart. We are plagued with doubt. We doubt there even is a God. We doubt the Bible is even relevant, any of its promises are true, and we are in a very dark hole. That's clearly one version of a desert. So you know what happens in deserts? Among the many things that happens in deserts, first of all, God fully has our attention. What happens when we're in the well-watered plains of our lives, to continue this metaphor? In the sunny days, the happy times, what happens? We're just grinding out our deal. We're just doing our deal. We're making money hand over fist. Everything's good. All the vital signs are up, up, up. Everybody's healthy. We're going on another awesome vacation to Disney World. Life is perfect. 
God doesn't often have our full attention until the desert moments of our lives happen, when we come to the end of ourselves. Because usually we human beings, you and me, we do not grow up until we're forced to. Don't act like it's not true. It is true. It's very infrequent that you have that kind of a soul that will grow in sunny times. Usually, we only grow in the desert seasons of our life. I wonder if God can ever use anybody greatly that life has not first hurt them deeply. Okay, let's talk about rebounding. Now, drop the prefix, the spiritual rebounding. Forget spiritual for a moment. Let's just talk about rebounding and why rebounding is such a big deal. So let me give you a word image. When I think of the value of rebounding in the NBA and why certain individuals with long reach, tenacious body position in the paint, and serious hops can knock down tens of million dollars a year, I want you to just think of one person, Dennis Rodman. Got that name in your mind? A little while ago, I know, but he's not a very forgettable kind of guy. You can remember Dennis. Okay. Rebounding is such a serious art form in the NBA that people will make millions of dollars to excel at it. How many NBA fans we have here right now? Okay, a few of you. How many of you know that we're going to the big dance in a week, week and a half, and Steph Curry, in my opinion, should be the MVP? Okay. Only about 30 miles from here, people. We've got the best team, best record right now in the NBA. We do have to get by San Antonio, pray much. Those old dudes are tough. I don't get how they do it, but those old dudes are amazing. Okay, let's get back to something serious here. Why is rebounding such a big deal in the NBA? Here's the answer. You hearing this? Because those dudes miss a lot of shots right and you know what in life so do we if you are really a player in the NBA say beyond the three-point arc if you can make 30 percent 35 percent of your three-point shots you are among the best half dozen pure shooters in the NBA now look at the other side of the ledger that means you're missing 65 to 70 percent of the shots that's why you need rebounders because six or seven of out of every ten shots are gonna be a biff they're gonna be a miss they're gonna be a brick That's why when you first teach young people how to play basketball, you say, listen, after you shoot the first thing, boom, attack the basket, get your own rebound. Now, we need to rebound because um, they miss a lot of shots. Here's the deal. If in the NBA they don't get the rebound, they won't even get another shot. The whole idea in this spiritual journey is to get another shot because at least six or seven out of ten times we're going to biff. We're going to do stuff because we're immature. We're going to do stuff because we're selfish. We're going to do stuff because we have blocked shots. I'm a dookie, okay? I just love Coach K about 15, 18 years. I love that he's not just teaching basketball. He's teaching life, okay? So I'm at Duke and they won. And how many times did you see one guy with an extremely long arm stuff in the, in the national championship stuff. I mean, just whammo down your esophagus. You're not even getting the shot off, dude. And very often, when you block a shot, the, the ball's right there for you to take, get it out fast, and go for full, full court. If we don't get the rebound in our life spiritually, we will in some sense be a spiritual abortion. We will not fully come to term. Gestation spiritually will not happen in our lives. That he who began a good work in us will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ our Lord. That's God's will, but we also have a vote. Not that we can overrule God, but if we quit, God cannot complete what he's begun in our lives. We've got to learn to rebound. When life absolutely slams us in the gutter, That happens to all of us. We just can't lay there. We got to get up, shoot again, get the rebound. Shoot again, missed again, get the rebound. Shoot again, missed again, get the rebound. Never, ever quit. 
The reason I'm so passionate about this is I see this simple sort of like life 101 principle demonstrated in the Bible again and again and again. The men and women that God most significantly used in the Bible had a sordid resume prior to the glory days. I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on in their lives, but they just kept getting the rebound and boom, take another shot. Some of you, for whatever reason, uh, you got your shot blocked, or you missed once too often, did not get your rebound, never even had an awareness that you needed to spiritually learn to rebound, and you've quit somewhere along the way. Or maybe on the outside you're looking polished and all like weekend church uh, person, but inside you're a pretty deep shade of bitter, or there's unforgiveness, or there's resentment, or there's a sense that I've been unjustly treated. Why isn't God as good to me as he is to this person or to that person? Or this thing happened back there, and that's why I am the way I am. Pain in our lives, bad stuff in your life, hear me now because I love your soul, has got to have a statute of limitations. How long are we going to say, I'm that way because... And let's not get into the deal where we're comparing pain. Do you don't understand about my pain? Honestly, if you're asking me, I don't because I'm not you. But also, you don't understand my pain. So why don't we quit comparing pain, see who has the most pain. That's kind of a pathetic thing to do anyhow. And why don't we say, what is God trying to teach each one of us uniquely and personally in our lives because you're not me I'm not you but pain will happen and let's make sure we stay balanced here this is not some kind of a sadomasochistic deal where we're going looking for pain because that's how we'll be most spiritual no that's just sick <laughs> just live for God pain will find us pain will find us so it's not what happens to us, it's how we frame what happens to us. It's how we respond what happens to us. And it has to begin with learning to rebound. Take another shot. Get up and get back in the game. You're gonna miss, never quit. The kind of rebound some of you may be thinking about or wrestling with in your life these days, some of you are struggling with a marital rebound. You're like, we're in a multi-year dry spell, John, and this totally stinks, capital S. Feel no love, feel no romance, feel no affection. I'm just hanging on desperately to our marriage vows. I made a promise. With God's help, I'm trying to keep the promise. That might be a rebound you're going through. Some of you might be with a financial rebound. You lay awake every night, borderline paralyzed with fear because of the current state of your financial world. Let me just gently insert here, that's exactly why we have Financial Peace University. Every time we have that class, we pay off about $100,000 of debt immediately, and couples that focus or individuals that focus begin to intentionally reorder their financial world and align it with liberating biblical principles financially. I'm just saying. How long are you going to cry yourself to sleep over your financial state of events? Remember, if we always do what we always did, we'll always get what we always got. If we're on a sinking ship, get off the boat and let's change stuff here together. For some of you, that's the rebound that you need to wrestle with. For some of you, it's a moral rebound. You did something wrong, legally, ethically, and, and you're paying, and you're saying, am I beyond God's forgiveness, and am I beyond God's ever actively using me again? That's where some of you are. Some of you uh, are in a sort of vocational rebound situation and you uh, one of the things I commonly hear is people that start nudging late 50s early to middle 60s all these hot bloods with major academic accomplishment are crowding out the old dudes and the old gals and you're hanging on for dear life just for a few more years till Social Security kicks in you're wondering am I gonna be able to sustain my current position long enough to fully resource my life until I'm able to afford a life after this career. 
See, there's all kinds. Those are just a few that pop to mind. Whatever rebound issue you're going with through, I just want you to know, you're not alone. David's whole life is a model of spiritual rebounding. And unless you're wondering about Jesus, let me just insert this New Testament vignette. Write down Isaiah 53.3. It's referencing Jesus, the Messiah, and it says that he was a man of sorrows familiar with suffering. So God in the flesh himself, Isaiah 53, 3, was a man of sorrows familiar with suffering. No one's exempt. Everybody in the room is probably in one of three places right now. You're probably a person that is currently in trouble. And you're looking at me and saying, oh yeah. Secondly, you may be a person just coming out of trouble. Thirdly, you may be a person just getting ready to go back into trouble and you don't even know it yet. (laughs) See, what you've probably discovered, what I've discovered about trouble in my life, I get three troubles solved and I think, okay, now I've got a window of time where I can just chill and relax, catch my breath. No, no, because you look up and 11 more troubles have stacked up and they're waiting impatiently in line. Does your life not work like that? Okay, let me take that a step further and give us an understanding. I operated under a false assumption that really hurt my life. Now, remember, I say that because as a man or woman thinks in their heart, so are we. In other words, we are the result of our thoughts, conscious or unconscious, happening in our spirit and our mind at all times, right? So I assume that this is how life works. Let me get these four problems solved uh, over the next six months, And then maybe I'll have a couple years of peace. And I kept holding on to that, and the years kept passing. Uh, I'm 55. I don't have endless decades in front of me waiting for that period of peace, which has never yet come. Because I told you, get three problems solved, 11 more are stacked up. This is what I begin to understand. I had to reframe my thinking. My thinking was obviously false. It was an incorrect assumption. I begin to take another look at Scripture, and now I begin to see my life and your life as railroad tracks. Think about the two parallel tracks that run in perfect aligned symmetry side by side. That's how our lives work. There's a good side, the bad side. There's good things going on and bad things going on simultaneously and parallel in our lives. So what we've got to learn to do is find joy, find some meaning, find some happiness, and not wait till all of our problems are solved. Because if we operate under that false assumption, we're going to be waiting for approximately the rest of our lives. Let me put it to you this way. God will pull us through if we can stand the pull. If we abort the pull by quitting throwing in the white towel, going into serious self-pity, the pull will never yet be complete. And I'm not going to promise you the pull will be pain-free. It's not going to be pain-free. It's going to be painful. But God will not give us more than we can bear, right? Why? Because he's the Father who loves us. Abba loves us. That's his central motivation toward us. He's saying, that crazy kid of mine, having another bad hair year, I love that kid. I'm going to pull them through. God will pull us through if we can stand the pull and if we learn the art of spiritual rebounding. Okay? Now, we're trying to talk about what God is saying in our lives when he allows these dry places, these hard places, when we have moments that suck the air out of our lungs when we have periods of life where we have the hope sucked out of our heart. Just a couple principles from the Word of God. I only want to give us one this weekend. We'll begin to land this thing and get out of here. Write it down. We've got to learn to grow through life's detours. Can I risk using another sports metaphor? Sorry if you hate sports. I love sports, man. So in the bigs, uh, Major League Baseball, if all you can hit is straight heat, fastballs, do you know what they call people like that? Can't hit curveballs, you can't hit split finger, just straight stuff. You know what they call that kind of a person? A UPS driver. In other words, you're not going to make it in the big leagues. 
you've got to learn to hit the high heat and you've got to learn to hit the off-speed braking stuff, split finger, etc. It is impossible to do. Again, if you can succeed three out of ten times, you'll be making 30 million bucks a year, right? It's not easy to do. Life is going to give us detours. Life is going to give us split finger fastballs, boom, and the bottom's going to drop out. But let me frame it to us this way. The bend in the road is not the end of the road unless we fail to make the turn. And we've got to, in our learning to spiritually rebound, learn to be nimble and change without growing bitter, without quitting, without throwing in the towel, without making it a big issue. Just be nimble and change and make the life adjustment. Core principle here. It's not in your notes. Write this down. Our Father in heaven does not always work in our lives in a straight line. If you're like me, a little bit of a driven type A, I like to go from point A to point B uninterrupted at warp speed. Whammo! I'm there. Just no problems. But do you know how often life works like that? It never works like that. So instead of life being a simple, uncluttered, pain-free trajectory from point A to point B, do you know what life looks like? Watch my hands. <laughs> then we arrive. Isn't that the truth? I mean, look at David's life. Do you have any other explanation for this ridiculous saga the dude endured in this life? Some through no fault of his own, some through his own fault. Life is not like this and if you're expecting your spiritual life to be like this you're setting yourself up for profound disappointment if I say the word the phrase that our perspective is more powerful than reality do you know that that's true and some of us have a perspective that is false it is a false based assumption that is poisoning your capacity and potential in life and you say, well, I'm this way because my mom and dad are that way, and they're that way because of my grandparents, and they're that way because of my great-grandparents. How long are we going to keep this thing going? I thought that when we came to Christ, the old is gone, the new is gone. We are a new creation in Christ, and we can break a broken tra trajectory in our personal heritage. The power of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his death on the third day is strong enough to break that in your life and in mine. So God does not always work in our lives in a straight line. He wants us to build muscle by what we push against. For those of you that want to be leaders in some capacity or are leaders in some capacity, maybe you want to do a venture capital startup, small business, whatever, or you want to take some kind of a risk so that you, the boss you work for in some sense is ultimately only yourself, although as a Christ follower we understand who ultimate boss is. Can I just suggest this to you about servant leadership? Okay, I just want to expose a reality about leadership and it's this. The roots grow deep where the winds are strong, but make no mistake, the winds are very strong. They are. In my own journey, I would rather many times have done anything other than what I've understood God's called me to try to do and try to be by His amazing grace. So if you look at the world of horticulture, on this winds and shrubbery and different kinds of vegetation, when you look at the planet and you see the windiest places, like where this church is located, <laughs> the windiest places and you look at the root system of the shrubbery the vegetation and life and so forth you'll find it is the deepest and the thickest the strongest why because that plant is holding on for dear life see when life is windy what it forces us to do spiritually is sink our roots down deep it builds strength Otherwise, we're a bunch of spiritual wussies. See, that's what happens. So 
Don't look for the wind. Don't crave it. But when it comes, don't be intimidated by it. Send the tentacles, your root system spiritually, down deeper into the soil of God's sufficiency and strength. Did you notice what David did? Check it out again in verse number 6. In case you missed it the first time. Everything that he has is gone, and now he's going to be killed by his best friends. The end of verse 6, but David found strength in the Lord his God. When it got windiest, David sent his roots down deepest. Let's look at one more scripture and get out of here. Check out James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. I want you to read that with me in a big, loud voice. Right there in front of you, it begins with the words, consider it pure joy. Would you do that with me? Ready? Begin. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Pure joy, trials of many kinds, mature and complete. Did you get those three pieces? That's God's truth. That's yet another promise of God. We don't often claim these kinds of promises. Oh, God, just thank you for the present of suffering and trials and problems. Hallelujah. Man, we run from those suckers. This is a central promise to God. Now, notice that it's an attitude of joy, not happiness. Happiness is so phony because it comes from the word happenings, which means it's circumstance-based. So the only time we're ever happy, if happiness is our focus and obsession, is when all the circumstances in our life are aligned and doing really well. But what happens when the circumstances become lousy? Then we're unhappy. But joy is way above that. Joy is way next level. That's why Paul could say, I know how to be content and joyful, whether I have much, whether I have little. When things are good in my life, when things are bad in my life, because my emotional and spiritual well-being doesn't depend on circumstances at all. Wouldn't we like to get there? If there were a New Testament book that is most along these lines, it would be the book of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. You might recall those words from the New Testament book of Philippians. Where was Paul when he wrote all those happy letters about rejoicing in God? He was in prison. Yes, he was. He was in prison. Did you know that? Can I suggest to you that first century prisons had zero similarity to 21st century American prisons? You were not getting three squares and sanitized conditions with a weight room and cable television and the whole deal. No, no. You were in a stinking, rotting, lousy cell, and I know this because I've been in them. Not as a person convicted of a crime, as a tourist. I have been there. Yes. (laughs) Just full disclosure, I know how this stuff goes viral in social media, and I'm just, are you people hearing that out there? (laughs) So the food you would get would be moldy food flung at you a couple times a week, and you're living in slimy, infected surroundings with rats and other crawling creatures, and usually you're chained to a wall. So Paul's dictating this to his amanuensis. You say, what that? That's a first century secretary. And that's the origin, the prison letters of the prison epistles of many of Paul's letters. Because when we rightly understand how to spiritually rebound, we understand that even prison does not imprison joy. Circumstances will no longer be the controlling statement of our life. Some of us are very difficult to live with simply because We live our life like this. Circumstances are good. We're pleasant to live with. Circumstances stink. We're a bear to live with. You know how I know this? Because many of you talk to me about what's going on in your personal lives. Uh, Not in a way of violating a confidence, but just saying, I need some help. This is what we're trying to learn about spiritual rebounding. So you could say that the life of the Christ follower is visible behavior based upon, built upon, invisible truth. Did you know that? Let me say it again. That the life of the Christ follower is behavior that we learn, visible behavior that is built on invisible truth. Now let me add this. We've already established in our Bible study this morning that pain 
is mandatory. This is important. Misery is optional. Pain is mandatory. Misery is optional. And with love in my heart as your shepherd, I just want to ask you this question. Are you choosing misery and to be miserable? Some of you are going through dark days in your life. Through fault of your own, through no fault of your own. We can't sort all that out right now. I'm simply saying what attitude, what approach, what center is your kind of default setting and how you choose to approach the pain currently in your life. So let me put it to us this way. Um, if attitude were an aroma, if you could literally smell somebody's faith, literally smell uh, somebody's attitude, the question I would ask all of us is this. If somebody could smell what's going on in your life spiritually, would the odor that you emit be fragrant or foul? Would it be fragrant or foul? You can't decide that for me. I can't decide that for you. It's, it's upon wh what we choose to focus. It's upon our deepest core convictions. Are you and I choosing to be fragrant or foul? We know now that the Father does not always work in our lives in straight lines. But even in those pain-filled moments, the God of the Bible is near to those who cry out to him. If we surrender to him, if Anthony, who buried his godly, beautiful, 32-year-old bride, can talk about full surrender, about fully letting go, about it in the big picture while he weeps and weeps and weeps with his two beautiful sons, says, I simply trust God even now when I'm staring death in the face. If that's what we're learning, if that's what we're seeing, if we daily submit to the rule and reign of God in our lives, then we're just beginning to learn to spiritually rebound. Because God ain't done with us yet. He who began a good work in us will complete it. If we let him, if we stay in the cane, if we shoot, get our rebound, shoot again, get our rebound, shoot again, get our rebound, bam, slam dunk. I've had enough of this stuff. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? With heads bowed across the house, if you need prayer because of a difficult desert moment in your life, painful circumstance, man, I love you. I would love to pray for you right now. All over the room, if that's you, you need prayer. Stand to your feet right now. That's right, just stand to your feet. Yes, 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 yes. Stand to your feet. Every head bowed. People are standing all over the room. Stand if that's you, if you need prayer. I would be so privileged to pray for you this morning. Keep standing if that's you. Keep standing. There's no shame in standing. Uh, this is about a, an act of faith. It's about going to God to get need answered in your life. And that's so biblical. That's so beautiful. People continue to stand. Anybody else, stand to your feet if that's you. Just stand to your feet. Father, you see these beautiful men and women standing to their feet. And I say beautiful because your word seems to teach us that you see things in us and you see us in a way that we don't even see ourselves. Father, you who are the embodiment of perfect love, work out your way, your timing, and your will in the lives of these beautiful people. My friends, my brothers and sisters, but they're your kids. So for these men and women, God, help them stay the course. Show them in the deep of their spirit how to rebound spiritually, how to stay the course. Help them understand what you're trying to teach them and that you don't change our circumstances until we change our attitude. So God, let us get it the first time around and help us become the men and women you've destined us to be. Your mercy, your grace, your comfort, your strength infused in these men and women right now. I ask it in the strong name of Jesus. And everyone said,